Hi, everybody, and thank you for, for, for being here. And this is the second part of our understanding and debugging event histories uh, workshop. Again, my name is Tihomir. I'm part of the um, developer success team here at Deploy. Um, so if you haven't, and I've seen a couple of you guys have raised your hand, is like I've not had a chance to uh, view the recording of the first workshop on this video a couple of weeks ago. Um, there is a URL. You can screenshot this page if you want, or, or you can share it also in, in chat. Um, so yeah, so if you want to record that. And also both part one and all the slides for this part two workshop are also on GitHub. So you can get the keynote files uh, for part one and two and, and view them over. This workshop, uh, of course, is also being recorded and it's going to be available uh, online, hopefully pretty soon. Okay, so just wanted to talk quick about upcoming workshops. One is March 2nd, which is optimizing timeout configurations. And there is a Luma sign um, a, a link. And then also in April, and, and I got to send the invite still, but um, we're going to try part one uh, end of April about for worker tuning workshop. So if you're interested in that, please go ahead and sign up and uh, those will be recorded as well. All right, so for today's talk, we got a lot of stuff to cover. So I'm gonna try to go a little faster than last time, but we're gonna talk about workflow tasks again, because that's a very important topic. We're gonna talk about task queues and things like worker identities and see how they all work together in order when we're debugging our event histories to try to find out what's going on with their executions. The second part is gonna be about activity executions and the history events around that. And again, with lots of examples and everything. And then the third part uh, is going to be just debugging execution. So we have a number of type of real user questions uh, um, and event histories, and we're just going to go through them together and figure out um, what the question is and how to answer the question using the event history. So just quick recap, recap, because this is important for, for this part as well. Last time we talked about what is a workflow task, and we said a workflow task is a contract through which your service, temporal service, and your workers, your workers that you deployed actually run your workflow and activity code and everything to communicate together to drive the workflow execution to some sort of progress or completion, hopefully, in the end. Um, the example that we showed last time was, let's say, a client application makes a request to, to temporal service to start workflow execution. This execution is then created in history host. And on the right-hand side, we see our event history. We have this workflow execution started event in history, which is always the first event saying workflow execution was created. At that point, we the service places a new task onto the a task you in the matching host, one of your matching hosts that your workers are pulling on. At that point, we have workflow task scheduled event. This worker picks it up to start running your, let's say, workflow code. At that point, we have a workflow task started event. And whenever the worker completes number of lines of your workflow code, it responds back to the service saying, I've completed the workflow task, at which point we write or the <laughs> history service basically generates and writes and persists uh, if workflow task completed event. So typically each workflow task has three events. It can be scheduled, started, and then completed or failed or timed out as we'll see. And we also last time talked about events or event order, which is very important when we start, when we look through our event histories. So we talked about workflow execution started always being the first event. After a workflow task, there is an order of events first, uh, where uh, the history service is going to generate and write zero or more events generated from commands. Now, these commands are based on your workflow logic, so your code that you write in your workflows. And after that, we have zero or more buffered events. And last time, we talked about also buffered events, which are the events that <laughs> the service received or generated uh, while your worker was actually running your workflow code. One thing that we also kind of briefly mentioned last time is workflow task failures and timeouts. So a workflow task can succeed, of course, if when the worker responds back to the service, giving it a set of commands, but a workflow task can also time out. And in the case, let's say, where your worker does not respond back within the, this workflow default task timeout, which is, by the way, 10 seconds, 
is configurable, but is not recommended to, to change. Um, how do you say uh, a workflow task can time out? A workflow task can also fail. That can correspond, meaning some sort of failures, intermittent failures in your workflow code. Um, some type of workflow failures can also lead to workflow execution failures. So for example, is you, if you can configure in your SDK certain failure types to actually fail workflow execution. Um, but the default type of uh, what Temporal does is on intermittent errors, for example, test failures, Temporal tries not to fail the workflow execution, but this particular workflow test is going to be retried, meaning we're going to put the test back in our matching host uh, task queue and allow um, a worker to pick it up again and start processing. The reason why I wanted to, to bring this up is, is going back to buffered events. So, so far we have shown that buffered events are flushed into the history um, after the workflow task completes, but it, it, they're also flushed um, on workflow task failures, or in this case, if you see in the workflow history on event number four, a timeout. So in this history, we see that we have a workflow task timeout. Let's say our worker did not respond back within the 10 seconds default timeout, but still the service did flush all the signal events that it received uh, between workflow tests um, started and workflow task, in this case, timeout. Now, there is another thing in history where you can see events within the workflow task. And this is events between workflow tasks scheduled and workflow task started event. And just on the right-hand side, if you, if you see, uh, just to kind of give an idea of what it is, is um, when an event is generated in the history service and moved then to your matching host to place on the task queue, you have one or more workers that are uh, polling on this particular task queue. Now we said when the task is available in this task queue in this matching host, we write the workflow task scheduled event. Now your workers, you know, they, they are completely probably separate services, maybe living on different networks. So things like network latencies or just the slowness of replication of your workers can contribute to a possible delay between when this workflow task is placed on the matching task queue and when actually your worker picks it up. During that time, new events can actually um, come to the system, just like, for example, in this case, a client signaling the workflow execution. So the temporal server takes care of that as well. These are not buffered events, but they're still going to be written into the event history and delivered alongside with this workflow task um, to your workers. So just to let you know, if you see sometimes some events between workflow tasks scheduled and started, those are events that happen uh, between when matching host um, uh, or the task queue and the matching host receive the task queue and before your worker, one of your workers was able to pull it. Um, yeah. So just to give an update to the final update to the event order of events, again, we have our work workflow execution started on the left, and now we're adding this more zero, more events that are in between tasks scheduled and workflow tasks started. Um, and again, we flood, you know, we have the events after that that come uh, for the order after workflow has completed. They're based on your commands, and then we flush the buffered events uh, as well. So typically, when you look at your event history um, and and understanding this allows you to figure out a lot of things. But this particular order gives you more insight into what events uh, can correspond to your workflow code and things like that. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> one thing with that knowledge, I wanted to do just a quick go through a simple event history. And I usually look at events top to bottom, but in the web UI, I know the default is like, you know, the reversed. So in this case, there is an error on the right saying, we're gonna start looking at this event history from bottom to top, all right? So we have event 66, we have a workflow task scheduled. So we're starting a workflow task. This workflow task then was picked up by the worker, and we can tell that by event 67, workflow task started. And for some reason, let's say our worker was not able to complete the workflow task, does not respond within the default timeout, and we have, we see a workflow task failed. Okay, in this case, the workflow task failed maybe because of an error or whatever. But now event 69. Um, what kind of, is, it, is this a buffered event or not? 
So be, because this is uh, this event, uh, when a workflow task fails, we don't really generate any events from commands. This particular event right after workflow task failed is a buffered event, meaning it happened between uh, workflow task started and failed. The next event that I wanted to look into is 71, which is, you know, happens between workflow task scheduled and workflow task started on 73. So both child workflow execution completed, and in this case, also a timer fired event uh, are not buffered events. They're just happened uh, during the time frame when the second workflow task on event 70 was scheduled onto the task queue and before on 73, uh, one of your workers picked it up. So when you look through history, understanding these things uh, can be pretty helpful. The next thing I wanted to talk about is workflow tasks and tasks and task queues. So if we look at the workflow task scheduled event, and this is just a web UI image, it's got a bunch of different properties. So two properties are very important when you're debugging your event histories for workflow task scheduled events is task queue name and task queue kind. And these allow you to really understand a lot about your workflow execution. So I thought maybe in the next slides we can spend some time on this. So task queue name is every time you create a worker, right? You give it a particular task queue name that it has to pull on. This task queue name can sometimes be the exact string that you provide in your code when you create your worker. But if you look at the bottom image, sometimes it can be something very weird and confusing. Uh, and we'll talk about that, don't worry. And as far as task queue kind property goes, it can either be normal or it can either be sticky. So those are the two values that the task queue kind can have. Understanding those also, and we'll go through that, is, is, is pretty important. But to kind of go through it and, and start understanding um, <clears throat> these, uh, these things, we I first wanted to bring up workflow execution. So workflow execution with Temporal is not tied to a single worker. So multiple workers can process and pull on the same task queue. So if we see on the bottom left, in this case, we have three workers uh, that are pulling on the same task queue A. Um, you know, and this is actually something that, a reason why you picked and used Temporal, one of the many reasons is this high availability, allowing what this workflow executions to not complete or not stop or be stuck if a worker goes down. So each workflow task that we have in our uh, event history can be picked by one of the workers um, and then this worker uh, responds back. So let's say that we have the scenario where we have four workflow tasks in our event history. And the first workflow task is picked up by worker one, then the second one by two, third one by worker three, and the fourth workflow test is again picked up, let me say like, say workflow one. Uh, because our execution is migrating from worker to worker, meaning from process to process, or, and meaning from one, let's say, container to a completely other container, without some sort of optimizations uh, that we can include, each worker, when he picks up this workflow task, has to replay the event history from the beginning. So by the time workflow worker three picks up, let's say our workflow task three, it has to continue execution of this, uh, 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 of, this, of this workflow. And at that time, we need the event history. Event history is our source of truth. So this worker will have to replay all the events that happened so far in order to know how to make progress in your workflow code. Now, given the event histories can be very, very large, this naive thing of just every time replaying the event history, every time a worker picks up a workflow task can lead to performance latencies. So one thing that on the task queue level, both your workers that you deploy using your SDKs and, and the server work together to optimize this scenario where uh, we, we don't have to replay all uh, event history every time. And this has to do again with what we talked about, uh, task queue names and task queue kinds. So the way I wanted to kind of showcase this is on the left-hand side, we have two workers, one and two, and both of them are pulling on the same workflow task A. So these are in completely separate processes, let's say. On the matching host side, what both of them pull on, let's say some sort of task queue A, 
And this task queue A, when we look at the uh, task queue kind property of the workflow task scheduled event, is this value called normal. And it's a ID of this particular <coughs> task queue. Um, is, I mean, it's also going to be, let's say, A. In addition, with temporal each for workflow tasks, in this case, each worker also pulls on a worker-specific task queue, which is this thing called sticky task queue. So worker one is going to have its own worker one sticky task queue that only it can pull tasks from, workflow tasks, and worker two is going to have its own uh, worker sticky task queue with a different ID. So let's say now, again, our, one of our clients sends a request to start workflow execution. We write workflow execution started event in the history. So at this point, uh, our execution is created in the history service, and this first workflow task is then moved to our, one of our matching hosts. The first workflow task in any sort of uh, workflow execution um, is going to be placed on this quote-unquote normal or global task queue. This is the task queue, again, that all of our worker processes, the poll and uh, uh, task queue A, uh, can pull on. So in temporal, these task queues are dynamically generated, lightweight. And the cool thing about temporal task queues is they can have multiple observers. In this case, worker one and worker two are both observing and polling on this particular task queue. Now, at this point, either worker one or worker two can pick up this uh, particular uh, workflow task. Okay. Good. So let's say worker two picks up our workflow task. At this point, the worker two is going to respond back to the service when it when it completes it. And then, and one thing that is going to send this part of the response is this sticky task queue ID. So when this happens, the you know, and uh, so on the right side we see uh, event history workflow test started, which means means one of our workers in this case, worker two, has picked up this workflow test. So worker two completes, we see on the right-hand side, workflow task completed event. And at that point, for the next workflow task, the service is going to, instead of putting it back on this normal task UA, it's going to try to put this, or will put this workflow task on the worker two sticky task queue. Meaning it's the server is going to try to actually put the next and also all the following, if possible, workflow tasks not on the main or, or the normal task queue, but on the worker sticky task queue. On the right-hand side, we see that the task queue kind in this case is sticky and the task queue name, which we saw also the property is going to be the ID of the task queue of the worker two sticky task queue in this case. So at this point, let's say our worker two again picks up this workflow task. We see the workflow task started event in history. And let's say our worker process or pod crashes at this point. Um, so what's going to happen first is if this happens, our worker is down. So it's not going to respond back to the service with workflow task completed. So we're going to see probably after this default timeout, the workflow task timeout event. At this point, the service says, okay, I did not receive a, a response from my worker. I have to reschedule this workflow task again. But because it knows that this particular server, I mean, worker with where the server is placing the task on a sticky task you did not respond, it's going to clear basically the stickiness. And the next workflow task is going to be scheduled back on the normal or the global task queue, uh, in this case, A. Now at this point, in order to still be able to make progress of our execution, worker one can now pick up this task and process it. And on the right-hand side, we see a workflow task started. And the next workflow task after that, the server is now going to uh, try or is going to put it on the sticky task queue of worker one, which was the last one that picked up a workflow task and was processing this execution. So why sticky task use? Why is that important? And this, to kind of understand that, we have to talk about a bit about worker execution cache. So each one of your workers has an in-memory cache of workflow executions. New executions, as a worker is picking up workflow tasks for the, the, the described new executions, are going to be added in this, this cache. The cache size is configurable when you know typically we are your worker options, and it's finite. So we don't, you know, every resource container or pod is going to have limited or finite resources that you can give it. Um, 
Okay. So there is also an eviction from cash. When the cash is full, your workers can choose to evict a particular execution uh, from its cash. And this is typically done, let's say, when you you, the cash is full and, and you have you another workful execution has to make progress or on every worker restart as well. So there is two things that are important here. When a worker picks up a workflow task uh, to process for an execution, if this particular execution is not in its cache, so it the worker has to pull the entire workflow history so far, replay the workflow code and match it against the history, and then is able to pull uh, continue the workflow execution. And on the right-hand side, looking at their event history, looking at the workflow task scheduled event, this is where you'll see the task queue kind equal normal, meaning a worker has picked up, picked it up from this global task queue, A in this case in our last example, and has to do all these steps. Now, if the execution is already in its uh, worker cache, um, the worker just basically has to process new events. Everything so far is already cached on the worker and continue its execution. So there is no replay involved. And this is when in your event history on workflow task scheduled event, you will see a task you kind equals sticky. You know, so how can we use this actually for debugging? <clears throat> so when you look at your workflow uh, event history and start looking at this workflow task scheduled event, the task you kind can um, give you a lot of under, you know, kind of info. You can first, you can understand if workflow task was scheduled you know, in the matching service on the normal or, or the sticky task queue, like we talked, the worker specific uh, task queue. And it can help for improvements, pro for example, worker cache size. If you see a lot of workflow task scheduled events where uh, you see the task queue kind being normal uh, value, could mean possibly, okay, let me increase the workflow cache size. Maybe it's, it's uh, workflows are being evicted a lot. I, again, use metrics alongside with that. So we can use it to worker scale, uh, possible worker issues, are my worker pods restarting? Why is this workflow task scheduled on a normal task queue instead of my worker specific one? And also if you see, for example, event histories where you have a ton of workflow task scheduled events where the task queue kind is, no, is normal value, um, it can also, you know, you can, at this point, you know your workers have to replay the event history a lot, which can increase or add to your overall execution latencies. So now that we know that, and there is one more important piece of information that goes along with that is this thing called worker identity. So each worker in your worker process or each one of the workers in each one of your worker processes pulls on a particular task queue and has a identity. All the workers in the single worker process have the same identity. Um, and um, this is configurable. And if not, if you don't set a, a one as the kit provides a default value. So given the identity, which is actually exposed in the workflow test started event, we not only know what task you, you know, uh, it was it the normal or the worker specific task your workflow task was scheduled on, but also we know which worker in which worker process has picked up this uh, particular workflow task uh, in order to process it. So how can we use this to debugging? And I actually wanted to go through this event history uh, in detail. And what I wanted to show here is the first thing, okay, in event one, we have workflow execution started. In event two, we um, created the first workflow, or scheduled the first workflow task. And this is the, this is the first, uh, workflow task in event history, we know that it's scheduled on this normal or the task you partition that all our workers can pull. Now on event three workflow task started, we see this property called identity. So we know that let's say worker one with this particular identity has picked up the workflow uh, task. Uh, it, it actually also caches this executions in its uh, execution in memory cache. Now we see on, let's say um, event number four, we completed this task. Then we have some timer started event, which is an event from, let's say the workflow code uh, started a timer and we see a timer fired event right after, which pretty much tells us on event six that this was probably a workflow.sleep 
or a timer that we wait on right away. At this point, we schedule another uh, workflow task on event seven. And in the workflow task scheduled, if you look at its properties, we look at the task you name, and it's got this long string, which is going to be the worker ID. And we can compare it to event three, the identity. So the, the first part is the same. And then a worker or a unique UUID. So with this, we know, and the task you kind of stick it. So we know that the second workflow task was scheduled um, on the same worker that processed our first workflow task that started with event uh, ID three. Now let's see on event eight, we then have a workflow task timeout, meaning this particular worker did not respond completion of this workflow task. Um, let's say we have maybe an issue, so we can figure that out. And now if we look at event number nine, another workflow task scheduled, meaning the server has rescheduled our workflow task. But if we look on this event number nine properties, we'll see the task you name being hello activity task you and the task you kind being normal, which means it, what we see saw earlier is the services uh, again place this workflow task, but this time back into this quote unquote normal task queue that another worker can pick it up. And then we'll see also a workflow task started event that is event number 10. And if we expand it, you can see the identity is something else. It's a different worker identity, meaning a different worker in a different worker process has picked it up. And, and now it has to do our replay. So just by looking at these three things, the, the workflow task started identity, which is the worker identity, and the workflow task scheduled, task you name and task you kind, we can actually figure out, hey, number one, our worker one is probably having some issues. Let's try to figure out maybe SDK metrics and stuff like that. What happened actually in in uh, to this worker uh, for this workflow task and, and things like that. And also we know exactly that probably our performance in this case latency was increased by a little bit because <laughs> our worker two on event number 10 had to actually at this point replay a pull and also replay our event history in order to make progress for our execution. All right, so enough about workflow task. I wanted to do a quick re recap on activities. So each activity invocation in your event history is typically represented with three events, activity test scheduled, started, and then activity test completed, failed or timed out or canceled. Uh, each activity has important timeouts. And if you uh, actually sign up for our um, workshop on um, configuring workflow and activity timeouts, we'll go through a lot of details on that. Now, another thing I wanted to talk about activities, activity retries are managed by the server. So the server is going to keep the timers for things like your uh, workflow scheduled to start, scheduled to close and start to close timeouts. And the server is actually the one that's going to initiate uh, retries for your activities. Activities in Temporal have a default retry policy, but again, it's configurable through your code. And one thing that we talked earlier about workflow tasks and sticky task queues, activity, there is no sticky task queues for activity tasks, meaning that each activity retry that happens um, can be picked up by any worker. So if you have, let's say five worker processes, uh, with each one having a worker that pulls on a particular activity task queue, and this activity retries five times, each retry to happen on each one of you know one of these these uh, processes, um, and actually you can know which one um, actually was the last one that either completed it and things like that. So again, if we look at the event history, if you look at activity task scheduled, look for things um, like activity type, which will tell you what activity you're actually executing here, you look at the timeouts and look at the retry policy. For activity test started, and this is important, uh, for activity test started, we have this property called identity, which is again, the identity of the uh, worker that uh, pulled the activity task and, and, and is processing its execution. And also we see this thing called attempt, which will increase if this particular um, activity is retrying. The important thing about activity task started events is that they're not written in history until the activity actually completes or fails or times out. Uh, each individual retry 
of an activity which can happen you know for days or years or even uh, uh, is not recorded into the event history and in case the retries or the attempt equal uh, equals or greater than one the actually timestamp of the activity test or the event is going to be the timestamp where the last activity task uh, was generated uh, in, in the history service. And their worker identity is going to be the worker that actually picked up the last attempt in this, for this retries of this activity and, and was able to either complete it or at that point it failed for some reason. So when we talk about things like pending activities, so we talked to, on the left-hand side, we see activity uh, related uh, history events. So we have activity tasks scheduled, meaning our uh, worker workflow code has requested uh, invocation of an activity. And then we have the completion events, including started, completed. Now, what happens in between? From when the uh, activity is scheduled and actually picked up by an activity worker until it completes, this activity is called impending activity. Um, so any retries, while an activity is retries for retries for as, as long as it needs to, this particular uh, activity is called a pending activity. And this pending activity information is not stored in the event history, um, but it is stored in the history service in, in this thing called a mutable state and within your shard that's responsible for um, this execution. Um, but you can access it still via web UI, or also via API via describe workflow execution. And this is just a web UI view of pending activity. So we have a composed greeting, let's see, activity that is already on its sixth retry, and you can get a whole bunch of other information, such as the last failure. Uh, on the bottom left, you see a schedule time, which is the schedule time of the next activity retry. And you also, of course, have the worker identity, which is the identity of the last worker that. Um, perform the invocation or retry of this particular activity. So you have a bunch of info here that's very useful uh, for you. All right, so given all that knowledge, right? Uh, one thing that we didn't do last time, but I wanted to do this time, is really start looking at real user questions and associated event histories and try to debug and see everything that we've learned so far and how we can apply it. So let's say this user is asking, why did my activity take 15 minutes to execute? And that's a very common question. So a lot of times you, you guys have activities that typically run for a minute or two, right? Or even seconds. In some cases, when you see the timestamps between activity tasks scheduled and completed, like in this case, you can see it's a little bit more than 15 minutes. So a lot of users ask, hey, what, what, what's going on? So let's try to figure out just by using event history of what could potentially be going on here. So if we look at activity task scheduled event, again, uh, one of the things that we can see is uh, the activity uh, timeouts. So in this case, we have this on the left-hand side, you can see on top a start to close timeout of 15 minutes and something called a heartbeat timeout for 15 minutes and some other timeouts. The start to close timeouts, and we will go through all of this in, in much detail in our um, timeouts workshop, but basically start to close timeout for, for our case now means uh, the maximum the server is willing to wait for this activity to complete is 15 minutes. Okay, so that we know that. If we look at the activity test started event, we see an attempt number two. That tells us right away, okay, this activity has uh, retried at least, you know, basically two times. And we see also the last failure, which is some sort of failure on activity start to close timeout. And that's relatable back to the activity that scheduled event start to close timeout properly. And then on event seven, we see an activity test completed event so this activity basically completed after on its basic on its second retry or attempt equal to so what can we say from this um number one is most likely what happened is the first attempt of this activity did not complete or did not have a response given our start to close timeout of 15 minutes the server uh, is then going to wait 
for 15 minutes, basically, for this activity worker to respond back to it saying, hey, I've completed the activity. So most likely what happened in this case is uh, the first activity worker picked up uh, this activity task. Maybe it crashed, maybe it couldn't respond for whatever reason. And the server waited for 15 minutes uh, for this activity worker to respond, um, given the timeouts. Uh, once it, uh, it did not respond back in 15 minutes, the server initiated a second retry of this activity, which then completed in what it seems two seconds. <laughs> uh, because if you see the timestamps between six and seven, that is the actual we talked about on six, the activity that started is the ti timestamp of the last uh, retry of this activity attempt. And then on seven, we see actually our com uh, activity task completed. So all in all, we can tell this customer, hey, please improve your start to close timeouts. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about that, like I said, in the next workshop um, and things like that. So there is a lot of optimizations that we can uh, do once, you know, the, looking at the event history for our executions. So let's see the next question. The next question that comes uh, up a lot is, is things like, for example, stock workflows. And in this case, our user is asking, why is this my workflow execution stuck and not progressing in this case? And on the left, we'll see the associated event history. So let's try to go through it and see what it could be. So, okay, so event one is always going to be workflow execution started. Then we have the first workflow task that was scheduled and we all you know, know by now that's scheduled in the quote unquote normal task queue and this task you completed. After this task you completed on event number four, we see a whole bunch of workflow execution signaled events. Now, we know that these um, events could be buffered events, right? So in our case, we don't have any uh, commands that are generated, I mean, events generated from the commands from our workflow code. We just have a bunch of signals, and then we have another workflow task, which is a stock it workflow task completed and there is nothing else. In these use cases, you know, oftentimes what happens is this is actually your workflow waiting on a signal or awaiting a condition. Uh, in Java, it's like workflow uh, uh, wait. I think it's also uh, the same with, with the Go SDK. But what happens when, when your workflow does use this workflow await on a condition or a timer in a condition, um, the SDK is going to complete this workflow task and it's going to reevaluate every new progress, like for example, a new signal or um, let's say an async activity completion or a child workflow completion, at which point is going to reevaluate the workflow state against the unblocking condition of workflow.away. So for this user, what we can say is, yes, uh, your workflow execution is not stuck, but it's currently blocked, uh, waiting on some sort of for example, signal to unblock its waiting condition. But then the user can come back and say, okay, but I see a whole bunch of workflow execution signaled events in my event history. Why didn't any of those unblock my uh, blocking condition? And in this case, you have to actually look in each one of the workflow execution signaled event where you will see a name property and most likely than not the unblocking condition uh, is not satisfied by the payloads of each one of the signals so far received. So long story short, in this case, uh, you're, it's not a big deal. It's not some sort of big issue with the server, but more likely than not, uh, your workflow is currently still awaiting uh, condition in order to make progress. All right, so let's look at uh, a next kind of question that comes up a lot. And this user is basically asking, why did my workflow fail? And uh, they have posted our event history on the left. So let's try to look through it. Now, the first thing that we say see on event number five is an activity test scheduled. And we see uh, its uh, retry policy. In the retry policy, the first uh, uh, information, the first thing that we can look at here is retry policy max attempts. So looking at this property, which is set to one, which is done in your activity uh, configuration or options, uh, we know one thing, the work 
user has disabled retries for this particular activity. Setting the max attempts to one in activity options basically disables retries for this activity. Then on event number uh, six, we see an activity test started. Here we talked about, okay, we see the identity of the, of the activity worker that's pulling that pull this um, activity task and start processing our activity. And we also see the attempt with number one. So this is the first time um, um, our, our activity is being uh, executed. On event number seven, we see activity test failed. All right, and with some error message on the right-hand side. Uh, then events eight through nine are basically just a workflow task, which we go back to, to how do you say our worker to process anything or see if there is anything to be done. And then event number 11 is workflow execution failed. And the question is why did this workflow execution fail? All right. Um, one thing that we can tell our customer is this, look, you have disabled number one activity retry. So your activity on the first attempt, if it wasn't successful, so in this case, our return, our failure with the message, some error message in this case on event seven has failed the activity uh, invocation. So we see the activity test failed uh, right after. Then we can say, look, by default, <clears throat> if your activity fails, it's going to deliver an uh, activity failure to your workflow code. Your workflow code can handle this activity failure. If your workflow code doesn't handle this activity failure, your workflow execution is going to fail. So as far as why did my workflow fail, we can tell the user, yes, your activity invocation failed. It seems that you didn't really handle this activity failure in your workflow code, which then resulted in your workflow execution fail. So yeah. Handle activity failures, please, in your workflow code. In some SDKs, it's much easier than others, but this is something that comes up a lot just because we forget to, to do air handling in our workflow code. All right, so let's, we have more stuff. Um, so this user is basically giving us our, uh, their event history and asking, why did my workflow timeout? All right, so let's take a look at this event history. Our workflow execution starts on event one. We see that it has a workflow run timeout of 10 seconds. And this is the one property in this case that I'm going to look at and, and say, okay. So the user has set a workflow run timeout to 10 seconds, meaning that the user expects this particular execution to complete within 10 seconds. If it doesn't complete within 10, 10 seconds, um, how do you say uh, the service is going to uh, time out this execution? So upfront that, that kind of answers the question, but let's kind of keep digging. So the events two to four, we see our first workflow task, uh, which is picked up by a worker. And we see on uh, event number five is our activity test scheduled event, which is the event that's generated from the command uh, of the of our worker, meaning that within the workflow task uh, in events two to four, our workflow code most likely than not tries to invoke, or it does try to invoke an, acti uh, an activity. But then on event six, we see workflow execution timeout. At this point, I'm going to compare the timestamps between workflow execution started and our event number six, workflow execution timed out. And if we look, it roughly corresponds to 10 seconds. So we have 3549, and in event number six, we have 3559. Um, and looking at the workflow run timeout, we can tell the user, um, hey, uh, yeah, I, your workflow basically timed out because you have set the workflow run timeout in 10 seconds. Um, and basically your activity of type greet did not complete. Uh, maybe it was retrying, and after 10 seconds of your workflow execution, the service timer for run timeout is fired and has uh, timed out your workflow execution. Now, one thing to also tell this user and what you can do is basically, uh, because the activity task was scheduled but not completed, even that the workflow execution is done now, it's timed out, you can still see on top in the web URL via Describe Workflow Execution API the pending activity. 
information. So basically, once the workflow execution complete, the pending activity information basically becomes a snapshot in time when this particular execution has completed. So even on this, for this execution, we, we can ask the user, hey, uh, look in your pending activities and you can see the information about your uh, greet activity that wasn't able to complete for some reason. And we see that it has started, but it's probably still in the first retry. Uh, and then of course your workflow run timeout hit uh, and the service has, has timed out your workflow execution. All right, so hopefully we can, we, we, we answered this question as well. And we have some more. Uh, this particular user is asking basically, hey, why do I only have one event in my event history? And this can be a little bit confusing once you see it for your workflow execution and you see only workflow execution started. When you see something like this, more likely than not, and it, <laughs> unless there is some big issues on, on the server side, we're dealing with cron executions at this point. Now, of course, we, Temporal has introduced a new schedules feature, and we will do some workshops on that, and then kind of trying to create some content around it. But for this case, we're just going to look at the cron executions. There's still a lot of us, us are using um, currently. So let's take a look at the properties of this workflow execution started event. You see the initiator for cron workflows. That is cron schedule. So right away, I know that when I debug this, okay, this is this is a workflow execution invoked uh, uh, via cron. And it gives me... Uh, uh, my cron schedule in the bottom, which is at daily. That's the Rob Fig type of um, way of that also server uh, understands of defining um, our workflow execution to be ran once a day. And another property that I'll look in this workflow execution started event is first workflow task back offset to 21 hours and two seconds. So with workflow executions, as soon as your client requests a cron execution, this execution is going to be created. So what happens then is depending on your work uh, um, cron schedule defined, the service is going to create a timer that's going to be set in this first workflow task back off time. When this first workflow task back off timer fires, at that point, our history service is going to generate the first workflow task, move it to matching and place it onto the matching host uh, task you for our workers to pick up. So to answer this question to this user, why do I only have one event in history? Okay, so in this case, you have a cron execution uh, with your cron schedule set to add daily, so once a day, and your first workflow task is going to be scheduled at 21 hours and two seconds, at which point your uh, worker will be able to start, one of your workers will be able to start processing your workflow execution. So hopefully we have answered this user their question as well. Okay, this one, and I know we only have a couple more minutes, but I, this is kind of like more of an edge case, but with crons, but it's something that if you're using cron, I, I think this very valuable. And the question by this user basically says, why did my cron execution start running? All right. So if we look at the first event, again, workflow execution started for this case, we see again that the initiator is a cron schedule. So we know this is a cron workflow. We see that the first workflow task backup on the left is 20 hours, 36 minutes and nine seconds. Meaning that for this particular execution, we expect the first workflow task. So starting with workflow task scheduled event to be uh, generated, added to our workflow history, event history, 20 hours and 36 minutes after the timestamp of the workflow execution started event. All right, so let's keep looking through this event history. We have some workflow execution signaled. So this is basically some signals they're coming in for, from different one or different clients. And in event number four, we have a workflow execution signaled event. And then right after that, we have a workflow execute, I mean, uh, another one. And then right at event number six, we start our workflow task scheduled. Now let's see, look at the timestamps. We see that the timestamp on event number one, in event number six is not 20 hours and 36 minutes. And that, that's the question from our user basically saying, wait, I was expecting my first workflow task to be scheduled for this execution 20 hours and whatever minutes after workflow execution started, but it started actually 
um like you know milliseconds after or some milliseconds after i created my execution so is chrome broke broken is the service doing something wrong what's going on and there is one thing with crons that is a bit of an edge case so as we know that our clients can signal our workflow executions but there is also a signal with start so a signal with start is an operation a thing that you can uh, actually uh, say workflow client signal with start and signal with start basically says okay if the workflow execution already exists just signal if uh, it doesn't exist for this particular workflow ID, create the execution and then signal it right after. Now with crons, there's a little bit of a um, thing with signal with start in that it's more or less like a hidden gem that if you signal with start a cron execution that's already um, running, it actually uh, triggers bypass of the workflow task back off. So is if you have a writing cron execution and you signal with start request for its workflow ID, it's actually going to trigger right away a creation of a workflow task and completely bypass your um, first workflow task back off or your cron schedule defined. Now, on the one hand, so to tell this user, this is why, so it seems that the signal on event number five was actually a signal with start. And then this signal with start, it's still recorded as a signal, but it triggered the creation of your first workflow task by passing your first workflow task back off. Now, one thing that you can actually use this for uh, that's kind of positive is if you have actual real stuck, I mean, um, let's say you, you, you set a too long of a cron schedule, and you say, I can't wait for another 20 hours. I just want to actually start <laughs> my cron execution to start. You can actually signal with start the cron execution and trigger its um, the, the, the creation of the first workflow task. So it has its positives as well, but it's something good to know. And I think this is the last one uh, that I, a question can I have. And this particular user is asking, why did my activities not complete? Okay, so let's take a look. Maybe we can figure out uh, why. Uh, so looking at, again, event uh, number one, we, we started our workflow execution. Two through four is our first workflow task. Now, events five to, you know, let's say 10, for example, are going to give us our uh, events that are generated from our workflow code. So the commands that a worker um, accumulated it sent back in the in the in our response. So we have four activity tasks scheduled events, and then we have a timer started event. So we know that our workflow code was basically uh, is asking us to invoke four activities and created a timer. In this case, it could be a sleep, it could be an icing timer too. Now, event number 10, we see timer fired. If we see timer started and timer fired in order, most of the time that's going to mean a workflow sleep or a creation of a, a timer, which we wait on right away, right after. But we don't see anything, any activity task started or completed events in history. So event number 11, we see a new workflow task. And then after an, uh, event number 14, we have see a workflow execution completed. So in this case, what we can tell this user is, uh, it seems that in your workflow code is trying to start these four activities and it's not waiting for them to complete. With temporal, you can also invoke activities async. In this case, it looks like the workflow code that you have and they can all, you know, the user can, can look at their workflow code and compare is starting to uh, uh, invoke in four uh, activities without waiting for their completion. Then it has a worker uh, let's say a workflow sleep, basically our events nine and 10. And at that point, it seems the workflow code just returns. So on the event, uh, so on the workflow task 11 to, to, thir to 13, it seems that our workflow code just completes the workflow execution and never waits for our four activities to complete. And we can tell this user, yes, please check the pending activities. Again, in this case, view or describe workflow executions and you can probably get more information um, 
on that as well. But yes, yeah, so this is typical. So the typical recommendation that we have for you is is um, if you care about actual activity complete uh, results uh, and you start a bunch of uh, activities async before you complete your workflow execution or return from your uh, workflow method of function, <laughs> make sure that you wait on those promises or features, uh, futures and things like that. So they're recorded in, in the history. And I think this was the last question. Uh, I really want to thank you all. Um, again, join our community and don't forget about the two upcoming uh, workshops.